thank you to our show sponsors, FMC Preschool, U.S. Borax, and Adama Canada. While other sources of innovation run dry and fail to understand your needs, Adama is here to deliver. And we're all in on you. Talk to your Adama sales rep today. Hello and welcome to The Economists. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and I'm having far too much fun dancing to our intro music um, and interacting with our guests, who I am super excited to bring in in just a moment. But of course, first, big thank you to everyone who is here. Yes, I am a few minutes late. I apologize. Uh, but uh, hello to Ray. And I see uh, Peter, of course, is here. Kevin's here. Janet. Uh, Warren is here as well. And Ray, uh, always wonderful to see you. And thanks for hopping on early. Tonight's topic is super exciting. Exciting. I love insects and we're going to talk about aphids and a few others and of course uh, some very cool beneficial insects as well. Did want to quickly remind everyone, uh, make sure if you collect those CEU credits, head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomists uh, tomorrow and make sure you let us know that you've watched the episode. Um, it's a pretty short window of time to actually claim those CEU credits. So do not delay, please. And thank you. All right. Um, oh, one more thing, which I should mention more often, but I don't, um, is that we do have a email list that is dedicated to this show. If you sign up for it at the same place you sign up for your CEU credits, you can sign up for the email blast. It will let you know uh, when the show is going to air, what the topic is. It will remind you with the link um, and it will send you a notice the next day that the episode is up and you can claim those CEU credits. So please do that if that is of interest to you. All right. Joining me now. We've got Tracy Bowdy with Omafra and Tyler Wist with Egg Canada out of Saskatoon. Welcome here. Now, I will admit, oh, hang on, I'm not quite centered. I'm going to have to wiggle over. Um, Tracy's, Tracy, as you will see, has been having a few issues with her connection and she keeps freezing, but she can hear us. So hopefully this is going to work, um, but she may have to bounce and come back. Uh, Tyler, you look live, so that's good, I think. Yeah, I'm here. There. You see there she goes. She'll be back. I promise everyone. Um, yeah. And quick shout out. Um, tonight we have producer Kara on the line, Pete, uh, not producer Jay. So we are in good hands. Okay. Welcome here, Tracy. Before you disappear again, uh, let's, <laughs> yeah, let's start with, we are talking aphids tonight, cereal leaf beetle, a few other ones. Um, I, I'm going to start with more generally, what insect pest do you have uh, sort of on your top hit list for the coming year as to what you're maybe most interested in looking for? Well, for 2023, I think I'm, I'm still really watching for resistant pests. So we've got, I know everyone says you keep talking about rootworm, but you know what? <laughs> it's a problem and it's taken up a lot of our province now in terms of problematic fields. And then second, that I'm, I'm really concerned about is um, dimethylate resistant to spotted spider mites and soybeans. So if, if it becomes a dry year, we're going to get walloped in both dry beans and soybeans, and we won't have another product to turn to. So I really want growers to watch for signs and symptoms and then give me a, a ring um, so that we can take some collections into Western University and, and test to see if it's uh, they truly are resistant and what other things they're resistant to. Now, spider mites aren't those those ones that if you have them on your house plants, you just use like dish soap and you just wash your plants and everything's <laughs> yep. fine. So is that what we're going to do? We're just going to eat some palm olive on a lot of acres. It seems like we're going to get that desperate, but um, there are okay. some predatory, uh, there's some beneficials okay. that even my Texan counterparts been testing out, which I'm like, well, if it can work in Texas, dry Texas, um, maybe we it. have some hope here. So, but yeah, there's very okay. few products that could be marketed at a, pr a price point that would be worth spraying. For that would be worth it. For yep. So yeah, okay. but I think the predators might work. Okay, let's hope. Uh, Tyler, same question. What are you What are you watching for this year? Of course, uh, Saskatchewan's got some great, uh, we talked about, I think last time we were on, we talked about some of the mapping and some of the forecasts. Um, mm. And those have come up as well. But we all know, of course, their forecasts are not always super accurate. But what are you keeping an eye on in uh, Saskatchewan? Well, sitting right in the middle of the Western Canadian prairies, I'm worried about grasshoppers this year. I'm going to say it in French, too, because it's super fun to say in French. Les sauterelles. Oh. So, oh. 
We had a beautiful think... fall last year. You've never heard Sotelel before? I no. And like, I know Coxinen, which oh. that's Ladybug. Yeah. Um, yes. But there you go. Okay. Carrying on. Grasshoppers also like it dry, which they do. We've had they a like it hot and dry. It's been hot and dry. We had a beautiful fall, which means they get to lay a lot of eggs over a long period of time, and those eggs start to develop. And so they'll come out maybe even earlier in the springtime. So. Yeah, watch okay. out for those pest species. We've got about two, I think, that should be on our radar. Lesser migratory okay. and the two striped. Okay. All right. So we can, of course, answer questions about those as well. So everyone watching along, um, we've got two experts here that can tackle several different uh, insect species. So by all means, if you have questions about ones that we're not talking about, um, you can add those into the chat. But uh, this is one of the fascinating things, of course, about our insect species is that there are just so darn many. So I do want to focus a little bit on aphids. Uh, yeah, because you promised. Of <laughs> yeah, I promised, so I better deliver. But one of the reasons is that last uh, growing season here, and Tracy, maybe you can um, weigh in on this, uh, we had sort of some discussions about, you know, are the aph aphid species the same between uh, different host crops, or are they different? Mm -hmm. uh, are the beneficials going to uh, keep them in check? And and we seem to ask this question always around soybeans, but of course, soybeans aren't the only crop impacted. So maybe catch us up on that side, and then we'll sort of take it from there. Yeah, there's lots of aphid species. Some are, well, yeah, many are very specific to the crop. Some have many different hosts. So green peach aphid, for example, can be found on a lot of different hosts. Whereas something like soybean aphids, it has two hosts, soybeans and buckthorn. So if it's, if it's an aphid, it's very likely, <laughs> and you're looking at soybeans, it's very likely going to be soybean aphids. Um, they, they really are pretty strongly tied to those two hosts. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and in terms yeah. of beneficials, yeah, there's a lot of crossover. Um, they, especially, obviously, the predators. Uh, they enjoy any honeydew, <laughs> the, the honeydew coming out of the aphids, they'll just find them and, and um, treat them like livestock and keep them, tend to them and keep them safe and suck the honeydew. Tyler, explain <laughs> what the heck Tracy just said. Because this is so, a fascinating thing. What are we talking well, about? Honey ants. Tracy is basically <laughs> saying that aphids are the world, and they really are. So if you've ever seen an aphid sitting there, it just sits there. It looks like it's sitting in a field of grass feeding. And Tracy's talking about ants coming along and milking those yeah. things for honeydew, which yeah. is basically aphid poop we call that frass but um when it comes out of an aphid it is honeydew because they are ingesting a whole lot of phloem and that's where the sugar goes in the plant and that sugar comes straight out the back of the aphid if they can so ants got these little balls of uh honeydew going away like a farmer who might be milking a cow Okay, so we've we're like ten minutes in, and we've got honeydew that is not honeydew at all. We've got frass, which is a great word, um, and we already have just that little peek into the insect kingdom and why it is so fascinating. Okay, so um, Dr. Dave Hooker is gonna we're going straight in for, and I I figured this would come up. Um, we are gonna talk a little bit about lambda psi, um, and where we're at right now this is still a big question as to how we're going to manage this product this year um we do know that it will be released and it is still approved for use on crops for food um and so it is probably going to be used but it may not be used necessarily as much so how does that increase the selection pressure uh, on our insect populations tyler maybe i'll start with you and then tracy i'd, I'd we do. I do want to get the two sides of West and East on this for sure. I love how you called it Lambda Psi. Sounds like <laughs> sounds like you've got the right? kids in a fraternity era sorority. <laughs> it's Very Frost good. Week. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, that was a good question, right? Um, so my experience with Matador is aphids come out when it's hot. Aphids come out when it's dry. That's when the populations boom, and that's when Matador actually doesn't work nearly as well as it should. So you got a top limit of 25 degrees Celsius. 
And if you exceed that and you're spraying, Matador doesn't have a whole lot of efficacy. So with spraying P aphids, and I had to spray it like 8 o'clock in the morning by 9 o'clock, it was already 25, and I did not get good knockdown. So there are a lot of other products out there that we can be using against aphids. Um, and just to qualify that, in the past, we did spray Matador for the P aphids and did get good knockdown. So you just have to watch that 25 degrees Celsius. Mm. Over to you, Tracy. <laughs> uh, same. So, yeah, I totally agree. Any of the pyrethroids, but Matador in particular has that temperature limit. Um, that said, so the bigger picture of the Lambda Psi um, is that we really can't be using them in field crops because we can't distinguish our crops, what's going for food, what's going for feed. Uh, some, in some way, they all end up in feed at some point in the system and we can't segregate those. So hence why we're strongly encouraging you not to use them. Um, even though the label will have some of the crops on it, please consider that all of our field crops um, really do end up in the feed system somehow, yeah. and that's where the problem lies. That said, we do have other alternatives for, in particular, for example, soybean aphids. Safina has been working really well, and in fact, it, it can be um, less toxic or, or less hot on the the beneficials. So um, some of the work here in Ontario in Eastern Ontario, because soybean aphids have not been an issue in much of the province except the East. And why? Yeah, there's probably a few factors, but they've got a mass of buckthorn. Anywhere in the province, that's where the majority of our buckthorn is, and that's where they overwinter on. So they immediately get to start up and colonize into early, early planted soybeans and, and um, get going. But Joe Cannell, um, now a, a private consultant, uh, did some trials on Safina versus Matador versus Control. And he was getting, um, I would say, six to nine bushel um, advantage with Safina over the Control. So we, we have other options. And, and the nice thing again, and Tyler can talk about their app too, but you know we have the soybean, uh, or I guess it's called the aphid advisor app, which is 11 years old this year. I yeah. missed the 10 amazing. year date. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I missed the anniversary. <laughs> Damn. Um, but yeah. so that app allows you to take into consideration, because um, it has the dynamic action threshold. It takes into consideration the weather pattern for the next seven days, figures out, how many aphids are going to pop out from all the aphids you're seeing? Like, what's that mm -hmm. population going to be like in seven days? What is your beneficial population like? Is there enough um, to feed and, and take down that population? And it'll tell you, do you spray or do you not spray? Which, which is at least beneficial. I think it's keeping you from yeah. applying um, insecticide when you might not need it. And especially with all the natural enemies that are at play, like um, aphids, or sorry, ladybugs in particular, you know, can feed on 100 aphids a day, each of them. So if you got some of those in your vicinity while you're counting, that's probably a good sign that you've got some good biocontrol happening. Mm -hmm. Tyler, you've got a slide, I think slide 10 that you wanted to pop up. Slide that's 10. right. Here's let's have arrow. a look at slide 10. <laughs> let's, let's do that. Hey, there here's the Serial Aphid Manager go. app. And this one's only five years old. But oh, we actually it's just a wee baby, just a wee baby. We based it off of uh, aphid advisor. And so talking with uh, the makers okay. of aphid advisor, uh, we use a, a dynamic action threshold in here as well. And we needed to work it out using cereal aphids. So we've got a lot of the same beneficial insects loaded up into cereal aphid manager. And, you know, with it being five years old, we have to keep. Keep these things, uh, updated. what do you call it, updated? Yeah, just updated mm -hmm. yes. for the new platforms, yeah. right? So yep. somebody's got a Samsung S23. Does it work on the Samsung S23? I don't know. I don't have one. But those are the things that we need to figure out so we can keep these things going. Now, and, do you have uh, a BlackBerry? I guess that's the only other question. Is it a I had a BlackBerry. I love that thing. <laughs> the government took it away. Yeah. I know. They gave me a Samsung yeah. S8, which the aphid oh. advisor does work on. Aphid advisor didn't go. work on BlackBerry. So maybe mm. it's a good thing they took that away. Maybe yeah. it was. 
Um, so Peter Johnson wants to know if we'll include the links to these in the post. And yes, we will. So for anyone watching along, um, if you're looking for links, uh, we will absolutely, if you head to Real Agriculture, head to the post, we'll, we'll put the links in there so you can find them. Uh, thank you, Peter. That's an excellent uh, point. I also wanted to, to ask Warren, Farmer Schneck, who's on here, if uh, the reason he's getting rid of any tree that he can find on his farm is because it could be harboring a buckthorn and maybe that's where the aphids are coming from. I'm sure of it. Anyway. Probably. Okay. So <laughs> probably anyway, maybe. Yeah. Um, okay. Just so Pete wants to know um, with milder winters, should we expect more aphids or early infestations? Great question. Yeah. Tracy, you first and then Tyler. <laughs> I guess because I was nodding right away. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> we have yeah. a lot of pests that are going to potentially be uh, a problem if um, not only we have the mild winter, but then mild spring and we get planting right away. But aphids in particular, and, and I bring back soybean aphid again, they are so cold, cold hardy anyway. They survive pretty well. They can deal with being super cooled, I think, it, uh, minus. 32 Celsius. Yeah, because <laughs> I have 39 Fahrenheit in my head. It's thir minus 32 right. Celsius. So we can have like Arctic winters and soybean aphids will survive well here still. So yes, um, we do risk uh, many that started in the fall, for example, uh, even in cereal aphids um, surviving well uh, and if they don't get drowned out tonight. <laughs> <laughs> right, because Tracy is near London and it's supposed to flood there. Okay, so similar question to you, Tyler, and, and Jason, who's out of Manitoba, is asking, um, where do our aphids come from? So do our soybean aphids move up uh, from other areas? Do they overwinter as well? Uh, what do we know about sort of the aphid populations in the West more so? Oh, those are good questions and some that I've been trying to answer. Okay, let's talk about soybean aphid first then. Like Tracy said, you've got this this winter host that they're coming off of, the buckthorn. But some of them might be blowing up on the winds as well. So your crop starts to senesce. you got a bunch of aphids in there. And the aphids develop wings. So it's super cool. When you are a mama aphid and you are carrying around not only your babies but your grandbabies, the population can respond to those changes in the crop really quickly. So cereal aphids, for example, let's talk about the English grain aphid. Those ones don't really have an alternate host. Those are ones that are blowing up into Western Canada, maybe Eastern Canada. I don't know, Tracy. You get those in Eastern Canada? And they're coming up when their crops down in the south are starting to senesce. So the crop gives a, gives a hint that it's starting to senesce and it's not going to be a very good food host anymore. And all those aphids get wings, they pick up and leave and they catch those prevailing winds. And we have a lot of low level jet streams that are really associated with the movement of aphids from the U S up into Canada. So really hard to predict when those jet streams are happening. But a few of the projects I've been working on is trying to figure out, do we have common times every year when these insects show up? And so, yeah, around my area, the Saskatoon area, it's about the second week in July when we can start seeing those aphids mm -hmm. in our crops. Are they coming off of other hosts? Maybe. So I'm uh, talking about cereal aphids. We've got the English grain aphid, but then we've got bird cherry oat aphid. Ah, that's got two names. That means it's got two <laughs> hosts, bird cherry. And that's that's a Southern name. So up here, we call it, you know, just cherry trees. Not really so much mm. bird cherry, but it is a specific species. And then oat, but it also gets onto things like wheat and barley and canary seed. Oh, so I've heard the bird cherry oat aphid talked about by canary seed farmers as that darn little black aphid, because they are a little smaller mm. and darker compared to the English grain aphid. They like to get into where the uh, the boot is, and they just get inside that boot and <sighs> multiply around. Like in canary seed, like where the, like, because canary seed has the coolest, like, head yeah. of all. Like, it's so pretty, yeah. um, but also kind of complicated. It looks like a light from Ikea. That's what I think about. Anyway, um, <laughs> like one that. that would, like, expand and contract, you know? Like, you could just, like, make it bigger and smaller. Um, yeah. So, also, again, Tyler... It, you're you're blowing my mind a little bit with now is suddenly they can develop wings when they need to yeah. and they're carrying around their babies and grandbabies like come That's on right guys. this is like yep. sci-fi stuff 
this it is, is what sci-fi insects do. stuff. Totally. A it lot is. of sci-fi is actually based on the insect world. So I you know, want to talk about one of the amazing. beneficials? Okay, so hang on, Tyler, because Scott Gillespie chimes in, and he's exactly right. Instead of taking out plants that harbor the pests, why not add plants that feed the beneficials? And oh, I love this idea. idea. What a great right. idea. Yeah, let's, let's, start... keep, let's keep habitat for our beneficials. Good, let's yeah. give some flowering plants to those aphid parasitoids, and then it becomes a yeah. sci-fi movie. So if you know yeah, how the sure. parasitoids work... Um, yes, it's we got terrifying. a slide there. If you want to pop Which up slide that slide of all the aphid mummies, oh, slide. You know what? Let's put up slide two first because I this is slide a really two, producer Kara. Slide two is and then a we're really gonna go to a clip in a minute. This is a really aphid scene here. You're actually seeing inside the delivery room, and you're seeing this aphid wow. giving birth to a live aphid. So, this is a mama aphid, she's I don't giving like birth. Eggs. To her baby aphid. No, there's no egg. Fa- there's no egg phase in this. Life. They just skip it. They so just go straight to live birth. They skip it. They go straight to live birth. This first instar nymph taps right into the phloem, starts feeding seven or eight days later, depending on the temperature. She is mama aphid and she's dropping the grandbabies that she actually has inside of her right now as she's coming out the back end of mama aphid there. So you're looking at an English grain aphid. How can you tell? We got these black butt snorkels here, which are not actually butt snorkels. Cornicles. But it's a great name. name. It's a great name. So, totally. so we can call yeah. <laughs> reverse antenna. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Unlike fly maggots, they do breathe through their butts. Uh, right. These do not. So what you're okay. looking at there are actually delivery mechanisms for alarm pheromones. So Ladybug comes along, starts eating mama aphids. She releases a drop of alarm pheromone. And theoretically, what should happen is all of her babies start to scatter and leave because she's worn them off. Unbelievable. And this is why they're so hard to kill. Okay, very quickly, because this is fascinating stuff, but Pete has actually hit on something. And you're welcome, Pete. I've actually pulled a clip of Pete in a wheat field talking about uh, aphids and beneficials and whether or not uh, seeing, yes, yeah, seeing beneficials in the wheat crop will translate to helping our, our aphids, uh, our aphid control in the soybean crop. So producer care, if we can go to that clip. <laughs> It's fusarium timing. We're almost ready for a T3 fusarium fungicide. I come in here, I'm going to look to stage it, and one of the first things I see, there's a ladybug. Uh Uh-oh, what do ladybugs mean? Ladybugs mean aphids. Yes, we have aphids in the wheat crop this year. In fact, it's pretty rare for us to have much aphid pressure in winter wheat most years in Ontario. This year, we've already had two fields at Seaforth that had to be sprayed. And you can see in these pictures just how heavy Kyle's pressure was. So prior to heading, it is 15 aphids per stem. That's one five, 15 aphids per stem. Heck, on some of these stems, he was at over 50. That's the threshold when we get to heading, five zero aphids per stem. So we walk through the field, we're seeing the ladybugs. Get your head down in the canopy, look for those aphids. And if you're finding them, then immediately you say, oh boy, We better control them. When we're going through with our T3 fungicide, we're gonna control those aphids. Wait just a minute. You control the aphids, yep, it'll help the wheat crop, but remember the threshold, 50 per stem, 15 at least, because that's prior to heading. And then, look, we've got ladybugs, we've got lacewings, we've got all these beneficials. And they're in here, what are they doing? They're feeding on the aphids, and in the process, they're multiplying. My good friend, Phil Shaw said, hey, Peter, aphids in the wheat crop, is that a harbinger of what's gonna come in soybeans? So we're gonna have to control soybean aphids? Man, the more wheat fields that we can just let the beneficials take care of these aphids for us, the absolute better we're going to do in terms of having those beneficials to control all the other pests throughout the rest of the year. So you have to scout if you're over threshold. By the way, also cereal leaf beetle out there in a few fields, specific fields, that's one larva or adult per stem at this stage. So again, scout, no cereal leaf beetle in this field, 
you see those, those window painting strips though, there are some fields out there. We want to get big wheat yields because wheat's $7 a bushel. Our sponsors for The Agronomists are Adama Canada, U.S. Borax, and FMC Preschool. Weeds constantly evolve, but so can your integrated pest management strategies. Knowing the latest weed pressures, resistance trends, application techniques, management strategies, herbicide science, and more gives you the tools for a proactive, agronomically responsible response. Go to www.fmcpreschool.com for recorded webinars from field experts and curated articles. fmcpreschool.com, your knowledge, your business, your success. Peter's so well, that excited was about insects. <laughs> Isn't he? Isn't it great? Way to go, Peter. Way to be excited about insects. Um, all right. And uh, we've really, Tyler, you've hit on something with butt snorkels, which I, if they release pheromones, I'm calling them butt cannons. So even better. Okay. Love it. So Let's yeah. Let's go with that. Yeah. Warren, Warren I wanted Dr. to James ask. That's a Dr. James word, by the way. Butt Is snorkels. It? I can't take credit oh. for it. Yeah. All Just right. It I'll send him a. Yeah, I'll send them uh, a quarter for a uh, trademark. Send them a hat. Um, yes. Yeah, hey, that's a great idea. Um, Warren says, uh, the $7 wheat dates that clip. What is wheat right now, Pete and Warren? Let me let me know. I thought that was pretty fun, too. Um, okay, but I do want to, speaking of butts, um, I do want to touch on cereal leaf beetle a little bit. And also this idea of what Pete is talking about, of course, taking care of those beneficials. One of the other questions, though, Tracy, is, of course, does... If we have high levels of aphids in the cereal crop, it is a different aphid that attacks soybean. But do high levels in the in the wheat crop mean we could see higher levels in soybeans? Do they like the same conditions or no? They do, yes. Um, but again, it it relies also on some migrants coming in because again, unless you're eastern Ontario, where you've got them coming steadily from Buckthorn at least in the early spring, we have to rely on them coming from other sources. Um, and that means from the states. So uh, it can be a good aphid year in general when one crop has it, like alfalfa or cereals, then it's probably an indication that the, the conditions are ideal. That said, we've seen it where, and we mentioned this, it has a temperature threshold too. It, after 29 degrees, um, soybean aphids stop producing. And at 30, I want to say two, they just completely halt and will not um, generate anymore. So, um, you know, it, it does, we're talking cereal aphids that tend to happen more so in our spring, early summer, then we gotta deal with midsummer to, to late, so conditions can change. Um, that said, I, I totally agree with Peter. We have seen where the last few years, um, there's an abundant uh, mass of natural enemies that come from cereals once they start getting harvested and move into our soybeans to help clean it up. Or even I've seen them in corn. You, you just tend to know July, August, that's where they're coming from. Okay. Yeah, those beneficials will move around. Unlike those aphids, which are very good taxonomists and only like certain plants, right? <laughs> They're choosy. All right, Tyler, you yeah, have, uh, you yeah, let's, let's talk about those cereal leaf beetles because there's also some cool stuff about this. Um, and we've got a video. All right. You want to well. see. Frass shield, I think, is another way to go. Oh, with it too. a frass! That sounds quite fancy for something that's literally them carrying around their poop. Literally, so, yeah, yeah, literally carrying. Okay, a frass shield. Okay, let's talk really cool parasitoids, though, as well, because these things are amazing and just absolutely blow my mind in the ways that they can be so specific and such great. Um, just control at times now but mark did mention one thing so don't let me forget everyone i do want to talk about fungal uh fungal pathogens that may impact insects as well but let's start yes thank you pete wheat is about 850 right now okay so let's start with 
do we have decent parasitoids of aphids? Because we have generalists and then we have some that are very specific. So what do we have for aphids? Tracy, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah, there's there are two really good species here. Um, did I have a picture? <laughs> Can we put? I it? think so. <laughs> <laughs> the producer um, Kara, do you remember? What's it interesting is, um, let's see if it comes up. What's interesting is we. Oh no, that's not what you were supposed nope. to get. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that didn't nope. work. That okay, didn't, maybe not. Nope, okay. I guess that didn't show up. Um, we have an um, Aphelinus species that came on its own. We didn't introduce it. It wasn't even something that we found in the States yet. They weren't releasing it in the States. Um, and just shortly, maybe two introductions, shortly after soybean aphids came, we suddenly were seeing these um, mummified soybean aphids. And, and I just happened to catch a picture of one parasitizing. Um, which is pretty cool. And, and they are pretty decent at what they're doing. Um, they're similar to um, minute pirate bugs, for example, that also uh, get the aphids. A and the nice thing about that parasitoid is that you see them. Those mummies stay on the plant and it's a lot easier to know that they were parasitoid parasitized than some of these predators that come in and eat away the aphids, but you're still uncertain did, did they do their job right so um so that's that was a pretty cool find back um you know when early oh aphids have been here now so many aphids have been here for a while um but it was just shortly before we started doing the dynamic action threshold and the um aphid advisor that we spotted that parasitoid too okay yeah so, so do we, that aphid yeah, advisor Tyler, made think... me go looking for aphelinus i didn't oh. find any <laughs> okay but it made you look so that's important Okay, so this yeah. is the cereal leaf beetle and the window Yeah, pane. oh, look at that window thing. So this is the damage yeah, to the okay. flag leaf that you don't want to have happen, right? Right. So you want to throw up the one of the mummified aphids? So aphelinus makes a kind of a flat black yep. mummy, but we get aphidius, yep. and aphidius goes after the cereal aphids, and you get this mummy that turns kind of a beautiful golden brown color right yep. there. So what's this mummy? So along comes... A female aphidius avinaphist, she sticks her ovipositor into a very alive aphid and lays an egg. That egg develops inside the aphid into a big thing that completely fills the body of the aphid. And then the aphid mummifies. And inside, this wasp is starting to pupate and form. And about 15 days after that initial sting... She cuts her way out of the back end of the aphid and pops out. Have you seen the movie Aliens? Mm -hmm. Stolen. Mm -hmm. Stolen mm -hmm. from. Stolen. Stolen. They were robbed. <laughs> totally. <laughs> so, uh, imagine, though, like, insects have just such a bizarre entry into the world at times. Like, imagine, like, hey, I'm a grown-up now. I'm going to cut my way out of this mummified whatever yeah. and be but, born. But they're mandibles. Anyway. Yeah, like, come on. Anyway. Check out my YouTube okay. channel. Yeah, all right. You're right. <laughs> Check out my... Some... Smash that like and subscribe button. Okay, carry on. <laughs> Sometimes, though, you get these other two wasps that show up. And what are those? Those are wasps that laid an egg on the wasp that laid an egg on the aphid. So these are sort of the enemy of my enemy. Right. Is your friend. Yeah. 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 Well, actually, no, that's the wrong analogy. This is the enemy <laughs> of my enemy, aphidius. This is like the enemy of the enemy of my enemy who is not my friend because these right. hyperparasitoids, they can reduce the population of the parasitoids. So, yeah, not I've nice. I've never heard this word before. Not nice. Never? Never. No. It's so, but I'm it makes sense. Listening. Right? Everything, everything is, I mean, we have food chains, right? Something always eats mm -hmm. something else. So it makes sense. Tracy, there's a couple of comments in the chat and, and I am looking at one of these lovely, um, they're all over my house right now. These lovely, they're ladybugs, but they're the nasty ones that stink. The multicolored engine right. ladybugs? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> these ones. And so uh, can we clarify, like literally they're flying around because they like to, as soon as the, the, as soon as the soybean field across from my house gets cut in the fall, my, my home okay. becomes their home. Yeah. Yep. And they come, but they stink and they bite. So they are a ladybug, yep. like a ladybird yep. beetle species. For sure. Yep. Okay. For sure. Yep. So are there they was still a weird... beneficial? 
Yes mm -hmm. and no. <laughs> they, oh, are. They, oh, they are the most aggressive in terms of the, like they're ferocious. They will eat the most so aphids, soybean aphids in particular, compared to the other ladybugs. That said, here in Ontario in the fall, they still need that sugar fix and they will be a direct pest on raspberries and other fruits, grapes okay. in particular. So usually if we have a really bad soybean aphid year, uh, malve will also be a problem for the um, grape growers and, and others, and and then homeowners um, shortly after that. So right, <laughs> yeah, they do. Hurt, they are the they ones stink. that tend. Yes, yeah, yeah. And then on top of that, now we have brown marmorated stink bug, which is also overwintering right. in a lot of homes in Ontario. So between those two, it can be a stinky situation. Yes, Tyler, aren't you glad you live in <laughs> Saskatchewan and it gets down to minus forty-five, and you don't have to worry about these things? Oh, well, we still get a few of those. Found the first Harmonia in Saskatchewan. Did, okay, like, do you have these stinky ladybugs? Yes or no? Well, we, I had we had <laughs> one. We had one, but it smashed it up and extracted its DNA. So okay. now we don't have any. Excellent. Now you don't have any. I, I'm flying over soon. I can bring you all that you want because <laughs> that once it, we're having a very slow start to spring where I am. And so they're still hanging out of my house. Usually the first really nice day I open all my windows and they sort of disappear. So, which is kind of nice. And then I tell them that I have done my duty as giving them a home all winter and then away we go. Um, so there you go. I can send you some Tyler. Um, all right. Well, our so other lady beetles, <laughs> they overwinter in things like leaf litter and the long grass up beside your fence. And so that yeah. was one of the questions in the chat. Wood piles. Yeah. So, yep. yeah, yeah wood but piles. like, that's nice of them though. They're staying mm -hmm. outside and not in yep. my home biting me. So yep. yeah. So I will, I will. Yeah. Anyway. So everybody don't rake your leaves. Let them stay over the winter. Let the yep. ladybugs live in the leaf litter. Okay? Yep. Because it hasn't been warm week? enough yet for them to leave. Like right. I saw they're, they're still leaving, hanging out. Because it was we had 12 degree um a day, one day <laughs> here in London. One day. A lot yeah, of neighbors were starting okay. to um rake up all that leaf litter in their um, flower beds. And I'm like, no, that's where it, it so, hasn't been warm enough yet for everyone to get out of there. So, this yes. is I I in my mind, Tracy. I I could completely envision either of you going to your neighbors and being like, "Please stop, like please yeah. don't <laughs> don't do that." So you know, I'll try and do the same. Yeah. But yes, Tyler, would you find yourself telling people to leave their leaf litter mm -hmm. for our beneficial friends? Excuse me, have you considered the lady beetles? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> have you heard the good word? Please. Um. Yes. No. This is. It is important, and this is what we're doing. We want to make sure that we're encouraging our beneficial populations as well. Okay, so, but I want to I want to come back to one thing on Matador, Silencer, the Lambda Psi thing, because we did talk about, we do have other options, and it's not a great fit in the heat. But Tyler, I happen to know that it's not always 30 degrees in, in the prairies, and we have early season pests that it might... Um, they bite sweet people. Yes, <laughs> the the beetles. <laughs> Apparently, they. I am delicious. So there you go. Um, what? How concerned are we with the like flea beetle cutworm? Like the early season pass when it is cooler, and we might be more likely to use one of those products. Are we then concerned about? You know, if we're not going to use it, are we overusing early in the season similar products? Oh, good question. Right, so we still have some synthetic pyrethroids out there. And yeah, um, flea beetles, a perennial problem every year in the springtime. I lost three canola fields, three canola fields in 2022. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, granted, I was offering them up to the flea beetles and I didn't use a <laughs> seed treatment. So kind of got so what I a... paid for. <laughs> I was going to say, so it was a predictable result is what you're saying yeah but i didn't really it expect them, them to mow it all down though they did mm -hmm. yeah. so i had a little reseeding going on but yeah yeah early springtime uh matador is definitely a popular product against against flea beetles and flea beetles have been strong pressure's been strong yeah really bad um so it is going to be one of those ones that um i i'm not sure how we navigate it to be honest because it 
to Tracy, to your point, when we're growing a crop, even if we're reasonably certain it makes food grade, byproducts become feed. So yep. screenings and, you know, cold potatoes and all these other things. Um, Pete has a good uh, question. Thanks, Pete. Uh, with products like Safina, so that are more pest specific with less impact on beneficials. I don't I don't know if we can say little, but I think it's less. Does it change the threshold for control? That is an interesting question. Tracy, what do you think? Nope. nope. Head, <laughs> no. No. Nope. Okay, yeah, so why not? No. Most thresholds threshold... don't consider them. Right. No. Yeah. Sorry, you were gonna uh, say threshold... that, weren't you, Tracy? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say the economic injury level is what we base the threshold from. Like we start with the economic okay. injury level. How much, how many of X pest did, causes actual yield damage to the point that it costs, it's the equivalent to the cost of control. So we find out that number and then we go, well, we know it takes a little longer. You can't spray <laughs> the day before you count that. So we knock back the threshold to a lower level so you can go and have time to spray before you reach mm. that economic injury level. So it's based on the plant's response to the number you have on the plant. That number is really not apt to change. Um, and if anything, it might go up. So if you have uh, more breeding and tolerant plants that can um, t tolerate some of the feeding. Um, you tend to not adjust that level lower, uh, especially for soybean aphids, for example, any lower and you are really doing no good. You're not getting, um, you already aren't getting any yield impact, um, but you are wiping out any beneficials because no insecticide is completely harmless to these beneficials, right. right? There's there's going to be some of the group of the army that you have, um, some species are going to be sensitive to it still. So um, yeah, that threshold and the economic injury level um, stays where it is based on the plant's response to the pest, not anything to do with the effectiveness of the treatment. Okay. Now to qualify that though, if your dynamic action threshold is you know, functioning properly, then the action threshold itself becomes dynamic. So the action threshold is before that economic injury level. That's when you take action. So yeah, it could change a little bit based on that. Yeah, I was thinking lower. <laughs> you don't. Yeah, lower. no, exactly. But yeah, that, yeah. That dynamic so action yeah. threshold. Because we always. But have I that, think he was thinking that higher. Gray area. Yeah. Um, yeah. That gray area between the threshold and the injury level, that's where that dynamic action threshold comes into play and helps you figure out, can I go a little longer and wait for the beneficials to do a little mm -hmm. more work? So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And and the and fingers crossed over time, if when we do have to spray, we do have a product that's a little easier on beneficials, hopefully we are building up those populations as well. Um, I, I'm gonna quickly, producer Kara, let's go to our last read and then I've got a few last points I wanna hit on before we run out of time here. Uh, tonight is absolutely flying. Our sponsors for The Agronomist are Adama Canada, FMC Preschool and US Borax. Understanding the interplay of macro and micronutrients is important when choosing fertilizer products and agricultural practices. The ag team at US Borax are experts in boron's role in soil and plant health, including how boron deficiency can limit yield even when sufficient macronutrients are applied to the soil. Backed by decades of field research and lab studies, we can provide recommendations tailored for your specific soil solution. Go to borax.com radio for more information. All right, we do not have a lot of time left, and this this I, it gets me every time that we start running out of time. Uh, but there's a few things I do want to hit on uh, while I have you here. Um, first, so Mark did mention seeing big populations of aphids in wheat that crashed suddenly due to a naturally occurring fungal disease. So Tracy, do we get the benefit of that in Ontario? Do we have fungal pathogens that can, can. take out some yep. of our? Um, yeah. it, you need the ideal growing conditions, especially weather and the canopy and keeping, maintaining a moisture level. Um, it's hit and miss. Um, some years are better than others. Um, and some of it may also be based on how much foliar fungicide we're using in other crops mm. or crops in the landscape. So 
But yep, there is a level of pathogens that kick in both for aphids and spider mites. Okay. Tyler, question for you. Um, If a crop like oats is under stress, such as a PGR application at the wrong time, let's say. Oh, I saw that in there. Yeah, and growth is, so (laughs) if anything gets, well, if things get stuck in the boot, I'm not going to ask you about PGR applications, but does, does a head snag, like does head snag promote aphid feeding? Do Uh, we know? There's so many, Jason, there's so many if ands in that question. That's like, there's like a PhD project to answer that. (laughs) Oh, well, Jason, (laughs) you need to start a PhD project on the, what is it? Bird cherry oat aphid. Is that the one? How many more names can we fit in there? Um, well, let's go so with maybe. cereal aphids. Eh? Most of them actually okay. like to feed more in the head. So they will hang out right where the kernel is starting to fill. So that is the sweet spot for aphids. And so if the head's not coming out, you know, it might actually reduce the aphids. I mean, yeah, bird cherry likes to hang out in the boot, but they'll hop up onto the heads when the head pops out. Okay. All right. Um Dr. Hooker has a question about, and it, well, it fits into Janet's question. Is there a way that our plants can tolerate more feeding than others? So what do we know about plants and their tolerance, let's say, of insect attacks? Yeah, go ahead, Jaycee. (laughs) There was the bus and he just threw you right under it. Anyway, he totally threw me under. <laughs> yeah, he really did. Oh, I yes, could go if you like. Yes, you could, you know, um, improving the plant health, but uh, that doesn't mean increasing sugar level, all of that. It, it's more just trying to plant in ideal conditions, um, providing, in, in my opinion, um, enabling these beneficials by even having more diversity in your landscape in some way right and then Mm -hmm. um yeah i don't want to go there with the nutrients because it's gone so far both directions um you know there there's some i think there's more strong response with things like spider mites for example because the um, plant uh, they thrive soybean aphids actually leave the plants when there's oh look at that am i going (laughs) <laughs> Maybe I'm not going to answer the question. No, we can. Yeah, no, oh. we can hear you. Um, but also, uh, yeah. I think we all were sort of failing there. But I think we're back. Okay, keep going. Okay. So, yes. Yeah, so um, on the so spider mites, desmonic yeah. acid, for example. Yes, spider mites. Okay. They thrive on desmonic acid, and so it they they stay on the plants and and. Um, take advantage of that, the soybean aphids leave. So there is a point when um, aphids just don't want to be on the plants anymore if they're super stressed. Okay. So, so, but it, that to me sounds like it depends on the insect and the plant. Yeah. And, yeah. It's yeah. a muddy mess it, when you start yeah. to play around it's with the uh, uh, plant yeah. 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 Well, I'll pull Tyler. Tracy out from under the bus if you want. So, yeah, I would like that. Yes, thank you. Right, we have we have different varieties out there and some of them are more tolerant to insect yes. feeding. So, you know, some of them can tolerate more insect feeding and it doesn't affect yield. Um, sometimes the tolerance has an effect on the growth rate. Let's use aphids, for example. So it could slow down the aphids growth rate so that their reproductive rate slows down. They don't have the massive population buildup. So I'm going to use an example from Sean Prager's lab. Yeah. Ishida was working on on uh, looking at wild varieties of lentils to see if there was more resistance or tolerance in the wild varieties. And she actually found that CDC Maxim, which was the variety she was using, was more resistant or more tolerant than the wild relatives. And so probably what happened was maybe inadvertently those had been challenged by aphids as they were in the co-ops as they were being challenged out in the field and they just had better yield because they were doing better against aphids so it could be an inadvertent Mm -hmm. tolerance it was selected for but when you're i mean when it's not something that's necessarily easily available 
per se, unless we get really specific, right? I mean, we have yeah. varietal blends for certain yeah. things. We have, yeah. you know, BT traits. Like those are very specific. But when we're talking more generally, that general tolerance isn't necessarily rated anywhere or ranked anywhere that we could see. So it really yeah. is a bit of a have the healthiest plant you can have and <laughs> go for it. There we go. Okay. Well, um, in corn, it gives off a natural defense called Dimboa for the first six until the sixth leaf stage. And that's why corn borer isn't a problem until after. So until there after. are some chemicals in plants that do release these. Protect but it. Yeah. for, I guess I was looking at the question as, is there something that you could do to manipulate your plants right. in season to affect that? And, and that's where it gets muddy. <laughs> Yeah, it's much better quite. off scouting and spraying if you reach threshold. <laughs> there. Okay. Talk to me about T. Julius, not Julius. What is T. <laughs> Julius? Tracy, I'll start with you, but Tyler, what's um, going on? What do we know about T. Yeah. Julius, not Julius? So, so that's, that's another parasitic wasp, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Tracy, because you apparently don't was, have any. Well, okay, I, I do, I realized, wait a minute, we did find it a couple years ago still, but this is a um, parasitoid that was not intentionally introduced into Ontario, but late in the 70s um, came from the US and widespread took care of our cereal leaf beetle populations. Um, and more recently, we've had these continuous hotspots of cereal leaf beetle that's shown up and we've been sending our samples to um, Haley Catton and she's realized back in 2019, we found only two T. Julius in four, four um, cereal leaf beetles that we collected. In the last two years, 21 and 22, uh, there were only two out of 83 larvae, cereal leaf beetle larvae, um, in, across all these, I think, 12 or 13 different sites. So we're noticing that our, we're losing T. Julius for some reason, um, not sure what, but fascinatingly, mm -hmm. they found a totally different parasitoid that they haven't even been able to completely identify yet. They're getting it barcoded, um, but it's not T. Julius. So we're wondering if it's kind of competing with T. Julius or it's just whatever factors were taking T. Julius out, this one is doing better. We don't know. So we, we did get some funding and we're going to um, survey and try and figure out what's going on. Um, maybe it, it, there's a chance it may even be a hyperparasitoid. It may be out competing mm -hmm. or yeah. even killing T. Julius. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of cool, but also a little concerning. <laughs> so, right. but I have no idea why we've lost T. Julius because it, it's now in the West and doing great. And in okay, Quebec, so Quebec's Okay, so Tyler, this this is still in the West. We still have this. Yeah, we still have cereal leaf beetle, but anytime we have a cereal leaf beetle problem, I say, hey, Haley, hey, Hector at AAFC <laughs> Lethbridge, why don't you ship me some T. Julius and we release it in the field and it takes care of the yeah. problem. It's amazing. See, this is, and Tracy, you and I have talked about this before. I really would like more mail order options for control. <laughs> <laughs> like I really would like more. I want more nematodes. I want more T. Julius that isn't Julius. Like these are good options. Like they work well. So on that note, because we're running out of time here, um, Tracy, you have been doing some work here in Ontario. I think are we are we getting closer to adding some nematodes or whatever it might be into our systems and being able to have these mail order options for <laughs> pest control? Yes, I think so. Um, and, and I think in general, I, I think we are having to move away from fully relying on synthetic insecticides because quite frankly, there's not that many in the pipeline and we're getting resistance to the ones we're using or there's a reevaluation and we lose them. So we are going to need to be moving towards biocontrols, um, both what we can have naturally here and help um, promote them and, and keep them happy but also encourage and release some if we need to um, and recognize what is working. So nematodes, for example, fruit worm, absolutely. That, that's likely our, our option to go for the resistant issue because we don't have a lot of BTs to turn to for root worm either. Yeah, for sure. Um, now, those nematodes Tyler? don't work too well when it's dry though. 
So that's a no. big problem we have yep. in Western Canada. That said, mm. again, Texas, they've been doing trials. They've had well-established mm. um, okay. populations. We were shocked. So it, it can happen but maybe, in Texas. <laughs> well, it's know. don't mess with Texas. So maybe they just got the memo <laughs> and they're just, and that's all it is. So that's how you fix this, Tyler. You just need a super great slogan for prairie soils. Um, Tyler, what are some of the most exciting uh, parasitoids or parasitic wasps, these sorts of things that you're working with or have seen and are super excited about going forward? Well, we've already talked about my excitement about parasitic wasps there. Why don't we throw up the slide of the golden-eyed lacewing eating the pea aphids because that's pretty cool, Ooh, I thought. Okay. So I'm super excited about these guys. These are a top predator. So you don't always see what uh, – oh, should I give you what slide number it is? Yeah, we're, we're working on it. Ooh. Six. That's a hoverfly. Also a That's big a predator. Oh, there's that gold there go. lacewing eating pea aphids. So she's a the adults. Yeah, she doesn't typically eat a whole lot of aphids, but her larvae, they have mandibles yeah. that are just huge and sickle shaped. If you go to the next slide, I think I've got one of those there. So I'm excited about these. You see those huge mandibles? That's wow. the business end. So it's yeah. skewered that aphid. It's injecting a digestive enzyme right now. And then it basically drinks that aphid like a milkshake. It's amazing. So uh, I had the pleasure of being bitten by one of these not too long ago. And after about 10 seconds, boy, did it start to sting. So it was trying to digest me. Mm. Um, why? Why would you let it shoot these things? Oh, just to see a class it was a demonstration oh and it got you okay so but <laughs> I, I will just really say i feel like to try to eat me well right you're, you're uh, I mean, has it. compared to an aphid yeah we are we are a large yeah, snack big, compared a bigger to meal that's for sure yeah that's, you want to go to yeah, another big know. meal go to okay. the next slide there Kara. what's what's next there we go there's, oh. there's a green lacewing larva those are new good and things though why are it's they, taking why out are a beneficial fighting? insect there, right? Yeah. <gasps> the jerk. Okay, but in, this in is actually, I love this, this picture. You never bet on black. No, never. Uh, but it's a great picture because the little alligators, the the ladybug larva, people see these. Uh, Tracy, I'm sure you must get pictures every year of people being like, what is this thing that's in my... And it's the good part. So that's what that's what a baby ladybug looks like. Um, so... So, but I didn't realize they would fight each other. That's ridiculous. Okay. Uh, Peter is. Oh, they're not he... fighting. That ladybug <laughs> larva is losing. Yeah. It's not a battle anymore. <laughs> that's, that's, they are losing. Peter wants to know why his precious wheat uh, with cereal leaf beetle, um, areas with cereal leaf beetle still have cereal leaf beetle, but other yeah. areas rarely have an issue. Is it, do, do you guys need to call? Hector or Haley and be like, mm -hmm. send us stuff. Cause yeah. maybe you're not oh, making the, maybe you're not making the call Tracy. Well, no, that's why we got Haley involved, right? We have been right. selecting yeah. these problem areas and getting samples to her and seeing what's going on. Uh, by all, I, I have every hope to reintroduce G T Julius. If, it, if it's going to work, I just want right. to make sure that it's not being harmed because of something that's going on. We want to, we need to improve the right. situation. So they're going to do well again. And maybe it's because of this new parasitoid and by all means, if it's going to do its job, then let's help it. But we don't know quite yet what's going on and why certain hotspot areas and even spring cereal is, is seeing a lot more cereal leaf beetle in certain regions. So mm. stay okay. tuned. We're just going to keep looking, but the absence keep of looking. T. Julius might be part of that problem. Right. So, right. You're not finding T. Julius. So finding, that's maybe why. So but also, yeah. But why? Right. We need to why, know why yeah. is that happening? Why aren't too? they there? there? No, okay. Yeah. There's no point in Haley yeah. shipping a bunch and then the same thing crashes again because they'll crash and don't do well because of the factor that is impacting them. So mm -hmm. we're going to look. Yeah. Um, Oh, Janet says, okay, so I didn't know. I always imagined that praying mantis were like some subtropical species. And I live in <laughs> Ottawa. It is not subtropical, really, at any time. And But we have praying mantis. Um, and Janet says she's found them eating aphids as well. So a praying mantis is is 
a beneficial yes or are they just kind of a marauder and go around and eat everything and like don't i love that you brought up the praying mantis i uh should have been more prepared i have have some videos of praying mantis eating things like grasshoppers and other praying (laughs) mantids um okay they're a real sit and wait predator so Mm -hmm. they don't go out and actively hunt they sit and they wait for things to come to them so they're not actually a great beneficial Plus, they're super mm. territorial. So you release 200 <laughs> onto a bush, and one of them eats 199 of them. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, it gets I very know this fat. Because I did but now that. it's their treat. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. And Next so, time, maybe release them like in, in like different bushes. That's a great idea. I know. If only where, you had thought about that. Where were you that. a few years ago? You know what? Now, I was I, busy. I do have a friend who does that. And she'll bring in her house plants in the fall, and each plant will have one praying mantid sitting on it. And then she says, "Hey, I can't handle all these. I need to give you some praying mantids." And I happily take them. And then you take them, and then now you have new pets. Um, and then I make that's videos fascinating. of them eating things, which mm-hmm. is yeah. Super so check, fast. check yeah. out the YouTube channel. Um, no, that's that is on Instagram. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's more. You can Instagram add music fodder. to it, right? Oh, right, of course. Right. And then you so can, I've got the female yeah. leading the male to Nazareth's love hurts. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I not surprised? It is true. The soundtrack really makes or break a reel. It really does. Totally. And the soundtrack yes. is key. Yeah, it's very... Um, oh, my God, that's amazing. Um, I just want to just quickly share, because you did get bitten by um one of your friends um is this like an an entomologist thing because when i was in university um dr curry was showing us about bees and he had it under like a um like a magnifying thing so we could all see the bee and the bee literally stung him and he was showing us how like the stinger worked and then he's like calm as can be he's like and that's hurting now so i'm just gonna remove her and i just think (laughs) is this a thing that entomologists do Yes. Yep. Well, okay. that was yep. such a great learning opportunity. It, was, it, it myself. with me, didn't it? Because that was 20 some years ago and I can still clearly see it in my head. So, yeah. being a grad student at you Guelph, got your money's you had worth to, in that class. You had to help yeah. test um, mosquito repellents. <laughs> oh, <gasps> Did you have to yeah. put your arm in the. Yes, Nile. Oh, yeah. You, right. And they have to, you had to put your blood, arm in. Blood, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, so, yeah. We, it's Tracy, just a uh, no. rite of passage. <laughs> Oh yeah. my god, I would have been so swollen. Okay. Um <laughs> Kara, producer Kara wants to know, Tyler, is your Instagram algorithm really dialed in? Because we talk about this a lot about the algorithms, about getting your algorithm right so that you only see the really great stuff that you want to see. And I would love oh, to know what, she's talking what that about. Means. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. You gotta dial in that algorithm. Popping up of other yeah. praying mantis species now yeah. in western canada we really only have a chinese praying mantis that you can legally keep so it's really sad yeah. seeing these amazing ghost mantids and cobra mantids that other people in the oh. states are allowed to have and one day tyler one day one day Climate just open change. the border <laughs> Yeah, exactly. They'll come on. They'll make their way here. I got to tell you. All right. We are out of time. We're actually over time. Uh, But this is so much fun. And I hope everyone learned some things as well. Any other questions, of course, uh, just zip them to me if you'd like. uh, L Smith at realagriculture.com. And I can connect you with Tyler or Tracy. Um, But thank you, Tyler. And thank you, Tracy. This has been fantastic. You're welcome, Lindsay. Thanks for having us on the show. All righty. And thanks, of course, to our show sponsors for making this happen and to producer Kara for putting everything together. I really appreciate that as well. And we didn't have any crazy sound things this time. Uh, Ray DeBanco probably remembers that. That was crazy um, times, but we did fantastic and I love it. Okay, next week we are talking biologicals. We're going to talk biological, uh, evaluating biological controls of things, what products are out there, what what you need to think about or know um, in considering them for the year ahead ahead so please uh join me next week 8 p.m eastern of course and as i mentioned if you collect those cu credits please head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist and let us know you watch the show um and have a great week everybody cheers